This is the study session on financial reporting and analysis and the reading on financial statement analysis and introduction. This reading could be called, if you happen to remember anything about your undergraduate financial accounting days, it ought to be in the next couple of slides. It really is an introduction, really is some uh, basic information, kind of a precursor to the following uh, more detailed readings. So let's get right to the first LOS. Describe roles of financial reporting and financial statement analysis. Financial reporting provides information. Of course, this is what we want as shareholders, as financial analysts. We want information on a company's performance. We want information on its financial position, but also we want information on its changes in financial position. And financial reporting takes a bunch of forms. I mean, there are uh, financial statements that are released in the annual report. There are interim financial statements. There are audited financial statements. There are disclosures. There are management discussion, management commentary. Um, if, you, if you just take a look at any of these major corporations webpage under the investors section, you know, there's a list of tons and tons of uh, financial statement reporting releases. Financial statement analysis, then, on the other hand, is uh, a way to analyze, to evaluate the financial reports. We need to determine if a company is profitable. I mean, that's, of course, one important part, if it's adequately capitalized. In other words, what does the right-hand side of that balance sheet look like? And can it, uh, can it meet its short and long-term obligations? Financial statement analysis, in the end, searches for under and overvalued securities so that the analyst can form es estimates and expectations of a, com a company's future performance. How about roles of uh, these statements of financial position and comprehensive income and equity and cash flows? What's the purpose of these financial statements? All right, statement of financial position. What this does is it evaluates, it, uh, it measures, it reports uh, the difference between what a company owes and what a company owns. Of course, the, what the company owns, those are called assets. And these are resources that the company has control over. On the other side of the balance sheet, is the liability and the owner's equity, which is what the company owes. Now, liabilities, these are contractual and the owner's equity is not. Statement of comprehensive income takes a look at the difference between what are the P times Q, price times quantity, the revenues that the company is able to generate versus the costs of generating those revenues. And so at the bottom of this statement of comprehensive income, we have what's called a net income. So we have revenues plus maybe some other income too, minus, minus expenses. Now, a quick historical personal point here. When I was an undergraduate of you know 19 or 20 years old in my first accounting class, I remember my accounting professor explained the difference between these two statements in the following way. He said, you know, the statement of financial position, this balance sheet is like taking a picture of a company on any given day. The statement of comprehensive income is like taking a movie of what a company does in its operations over time. And I thought it was kind of silly uh, back then, but as I'm sure many of you know, a 19 year old's brain is not fully formed. And so uh, I was wrong. I mean, this is a perfect way to describe these two financial statements. And interestingly enough, it has stuck with me all these years. How about the statement of changes in equity? What this does is this provides information on the owner's investments. Uh, what are we faced with as a business? What's the goal of the business? Maximize shareholder wealth. Well, how do we do this? We make capital budgeting decisions that are going to swell the equity portion of the balance sheet so that the corporate leaders can do one of two things. They can take some money out and pay a dividend out of retained earnings, or they can reinvest it back into the company. That's called capital budgeting. And so that statement of changes in equity is a pretty critical component of, of the balance sheet, even though it's its own separate, its own separate statement, but uh, it'll be summarized on the balance sheet. 
And then the statement of cash flows. This is what a financial analyst is really interested in. This is a disclosure of the company's uses and the sources of cash. It's divided into three, pretty much three classifications. Operating cash flows. These are cash flows that are generated from the assets of the company. The product lines that the company develops, you know, they have the P times Q, so they generate revenue, they incur expenses, but these operating cash flows are cash. This is important. It's cash that is generated by those assets. And then cash flow from investing activities, investing meaning uh, the purchase of long-term assets or the disposal of long-term assets. And then financing activities are those cash flows associated with, you know, maybe issuing a bond or, or repurchasing a bond. Uh, describe the importance of the financial statement notes. Are they important? Uh, of course they are. They, they provide important disclosures on all sorts of stuff. I mean, suppose that you looked at a financial statement and you were looking at the balance sheet and you saw inventory at some number 100 and in the notes, uh, you read, oh, this inventory was calculated using Jim's inventory valuation method. I mean, who am I? I'm just kind of a nobody. And so those notes, they reveal, they reveal some important decisions that the corporate leaders can make that are consistent with fundamental accounting principles. Supplementary information is also important uh, because it tells, it can tell a lot, it can reveal quite a lot about financial risks and contingencies. Um, and then the management's commentary, you ought to go to a web page and read this management commentary because it's pretty interesting to get a sense of, of what the executives are thinking about history, about, you know, they'll say something like, oh yeah, we did really, really well this past quarter, but we think we're even gonna do better next quarter because we're gonna do this and this and this. All right, what's the objective of, uh, of the audit of financial statements? Now, remember that anybody can put together financial statements using any kinds of rules. So we need to put together these financial statements that are in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. And the job of the auditor, whether it's an internal or an external auditor, is to make certain that these rules are being followed. No financial analyst wants to read a set of financial uh, reports that have been compiled using Jim's inventory method or Jim's depreciation method or Jim's contingency revenue method. Ah, so what's the main objective here? We got two of them to determine whether those financial statements are free from material misstatement. Oh, the independent auditor that auditor then expresses an opinion. We'll talk about that in just a few slides. And then the second goal is to report on those financial statements that they're in accordance with uh, those standards that are required by, you know, the accounting bodies out there that control this kind of stuff. Here we go. What are the different kinds of audit reports? We can go all the way from an unqualified audit opinion which pretty much means that the auditor has found that these things are in accordance with accounting standards. All the way down to the adverse audit opinion when, uh, when the independent auditor cannot make that claim. In other words, the auditor can make the opposite com com uh, claim that these material de materially depart from accounting standards and are not either accurately or fairly presented. And then there's one in the middle, a qualified audit opinion, and that allows for, you know, kind of some room in which the auditor finds maybe some information that was not made available, or maybe it's not available, or maybe there was an exception to some accounting standards. That's a qualified audit opinion. And then the final one is a disclaimer. And this is when the auditor says, look, I, I just can't, I can't make a decision one way or another for any number of reasons. Now, how about the importance of the effective internal controls and the types of audit reports? So look down in that bottom right box. There's uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers. There's uh, one of the well-known um, public accounting firms. And what do they say in that top left box? If you read that top left box, even though it's in relatively small writing, it sounds something like, you know what? 
we're pretty smart. We have a lot of accountants in our firm. We've really worked hard. We've worked really hard going over Nike's uh, financial statements. And uh, we've done it this year. We did it last year. We did it the year before. And we're pretty sure they conform with accounting principles. Now, internally, we need to make certain that we have these effective internal controls so that when the internal accountants and the internal auditors put together and then evaluate the financial reporting, that there's a process. And in fact, you know, there was an act, you know, years and years ago, Sarbanes-Oxley, Oxley, that suggested, that required actually, that these publicly traded companies have to demonstrate that their internal controls are effective. And of course, um, Sarbox was in response to lots and lots of companies that you know, pretty much just lied to us as investors, as shareholders, and as, uh, as auditors, and as financial managers. And so what the act does is it, it requires management to take responsibility, not just the accounting people, but, but management. In fact, here's a statement from Nike. Management of Nike is responsible for the information and representations contained in this report. Yeah. Uh, what else is out there? So financial analysts are going to try to find over or undervalued securities based on financial reporting and then their analysis of that financial reporting. But financial analysts also use quarterly or semi-annual reports. Um, they look at things like insider trading. They look at basic financial statements that may or may not be audited since the last uh, audited financial statement because even without an official audit, there's still valuable information contained in those reports. Of course, financial analysts can go to company websites and read the press releases and participate in the conference calls. I mean, company websites, of course, you know, you guys know this, are fantastic sources of information. I love to tell my students when, when we have an assignment, go and look at all their product lines and see all the brand names. Like, you know, I think we, we kind of hinted on that in a previous video when we did the Johnson & Johnson Board of Directors. Go and see what Johnson & Johnson makes. They have three business segments. They make all sorts of stuff. And then there are periodic earnings announcements as well. All right, what about the steps in the financial statement analysis framework. All right, so what we need to do, like many, many things, is to start with a purpose. Give a context, you know, try to figure out what is our approach, what are our goals, and the format. And we collect the data, try to put it in uh, some uh, common sense categories, and then process the data using all sorts of analytical tools, whether those are whether those are accounting related or investment related or derivative security related. We have all, all these computer algorithms that are gonna help us process the data. And then of course we need to analyze it. And this is where the financial analyst skill set comes into play, whether or not they can ultimately decide whether or not the uh, security is over or undervalued and then developing conclusions and then communicating those conclusions and making recommendations. And then this is probably, uh, this is a really critical step here is to, is to do the follow-up and to provide the feedback and the looping because, you know, inevitably a financial analyst is gonna make a mistake. And so it's critical to go back and say, all right, this led me, this led me, this led me. You know, these three things led me to believe that this particular stock was undervalued. And in fact, over the next six or 12 months, that stock lost 10 or 20%. Where did I make my mistake? And that's critical. Nobody, no shareholder, no investor is going to expect a financial analyst to be perfect. The only people that we expect to be perfect are referees in sports contests, but nobody expects them, but they expect you to learn. They expect you not to make the mistake, the same mistake again. So follow-up is important. And I think that takes us through our introduction. Hopefully what I said at the beginning of the slide was in fact true, that uh, I bet you remember lots of this stuff from your financial accounting days. So now we'll look at some reporting standards and then look at, we'll talk, take, a, take a look at all the different statements and all the different important accounts.